Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining our training session today. I'm Ben Lincoln, Managing Principal at Bishop Fox. My role here is leading a team of consultants and pen testers while also focusing on application security and offensive security research initiatives. Before we get started, I'll give you a quick introduction about myself. I've been at Bishop Fox since 2019, but I've worked in security professionally as a consultant or FTE since 2011. I specialize in reverse engineering and network or organization-wide penetration testing, but I also like to do deep dives into application security as well as developing tooling and exploits. During this training session, we are going to cover a severe Java deserialization vulnerability in GWT, why it matters for GWT web application security, and how to exploit a vulnerable GWT web application using an intentionally vulnerable application I built specifically for training purposes. If you'd like to chat and hang out after the live stream, meet me in the Hacker's Lounge on the Bishop Fox RedSec Discord server. Let's get started. GWT is a framework originally developed at Google, but later transferred to an open source organization for developing web applications in Java. The server side of the application is compiled like regular Java code, but the browser side of the application is automatically transformed into HTML and JavaScript. The code running in the browser communicates with the server using the GWT RPC protocol by default. Depending on how the application is written, GWT may set up some of the RPC calls to transmit certain values as binary serialized Java objects, and that's when the deserialization vulnerability occurs. Exploiting it successfully requires some custom tooling, which we released a few months ago. If you are responsible for a web application written using GWT, I strongly recommend determining if it's vulnerable, and if so, removing the associated functionality. Attackers might need credentials to find vulnerable GWT RPC methods in an unfamiliar application, but in most cases, a vulnerable GWT application can be exploited without credentials once an attacker discovers one or more vulnerable GWT RPC methods. The history of this vulnerability goes back to 2015 or earlier, but details of how to exploit it weren't available publicly until December 2023. In other words, there were at least eight years for web developers to unintentionally build code bases that included the vulnerable functionality, and removing that functionality could require substantial changes to the software now that the scope of the problem is clear. After we disclosed details of how to exploit this issue, the GWT developers issued an update that disabled the vulnerable feature by default. However, that change doesn't remediate the problem for existing GWT-based applications because disabling the feature will prevent them from working and turning the feature back on makes them vulnerable again. I'll show you a demo of discovering and exploiting an instance of this deserialization vulnerability in an example GWT application. Here's a walkthrough of locating binary serialized Java objects in traffic between a browser and a GWT-based web application, then exploiting the vulnerability. From the perspective of an end user, there's usually no way to tell if a web application was written using GWT or if it uses GWT's binary Java serialization. In this example, I'm using the intentionally vulnerable GWT app that we shared a few months ago, which is based on a stock symbol example from the GWT Getting Started guide. As you can see, it looks like just about any other web application. Now that I've interacted with the web application a little bit, I'll switch over to Burp Suite and show you some of the indicators that this application was written using GWT, as well as indicators that it uses the vulnerable binary serialization functionality. GWT supports several different ways for browsers to communicate with the web application server. In these examples, I'm only going to discuss the GWT RPC mechanism because it's the only one where exploitation has been demonstrated publicly. However, it's also the default mechanism, so it's very likely that if you run across a GWT-based application, it will use GWT RPC. In GWT RPC post requests, you will typically see some specific headers and values that are dead giveaways. As you can see here, the content type header value includes x GWT RPC, and there are x GWT permutation and x GWT module base headers. So one easy way to flag GWT RPC traffic is to filter by requests that include headers containing dash GWT dash. In the body of the same request, you can see the characteristic default GWT RPC pipe delimited format, and this will often contain several instances of the text GWT. Because GWT is an entire web application framework, not just an RPC mechanism, GWT-based apps will also usually include other references to GWT in responses sent down to the client. For example, filtering by GWT colon property might show you HTML code related to pages in a GWT app. 
dollar sign gwit dollar sign gwit underscore version or dollar sign strong name would be good options for finding the JavaScript code that gwit typically generates when an application is compiled. Dot gwit dot or dot gwit dot RPC might help you find the serialization policy files that gwit RPC uses. You can try just filtering by GWT, but you'll probably have to wade through a lot of false positives. Once you've confirmed that the application uses GWT, there are two main ways to determine if it's vulnerable to the deserialization attack I'll demonstrate a little later. The first way is the easiest, but it depends on exercising as much of the web application functionality as possible. For this method, you are just going to filter the traffic by the string pipe, lowercase r, capital O, zero, and see if you get any hits. That three-character string is the base64 encoding of the two-byte sequence ACED, which is the standard header for Java's built-in binary object serialization format. The pipe at the beginning helps filter out content that's not related to GWT, as well as base64 data that contains the two-byte sequence, but not at the beginning. As you can see, this request looks very similar to the other GWT RPC request I showed you earlier, but there's a short base64 encoded value beginning with the encoded Java serialization header. If you see that pattern in a GWT RPC request, it's almost guaranteed that the web application is vulnerable to a deserialization attack. It might not be vulnerable if the app owner specifically added filtering logic to their code or put a filtering layer in front of the web app, like a web application firewall or a load balancer with custom rules. The presence of the binary serialized data strongly implies that the web app is using that data for something, and it's very difficult to define and maintain a filter that blocks all exploitation, but also allows legitimate GWT RPC traffic. That's one of the reasons that the real fix for a vulnerable GWT-based application is to modify the application itself so that it doesn't use the binary serialization mechanism anymore, as opposed to trying to block malicious requests. Now I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and show you how to exploit the vulnerability because the second method for determining if a GWT-based application is vulnerable is much more involved. GWT uses a slightly unusual variation on serialized Java objects. Most Java applications that use the built-in binary serialization mechanism in an insecure way will read an arbitrary object right from the beginning of the stream. GWT does not. It expects the first object to be an integer that represents the number of objects in the stream. For each entry in the stream after that integer, GWT expects a Java string that identifies the field and then the actual arbitrary object associated with that field. So the bare minimum exploit payload is actually three Java objects, the integer one, any valid string, and then the malicious object. Most pen testers use YSO serial to exploit Java deserialization vulnerabilities, and the standard version of YSO serial doesn't support chaining multiple objects together. Additionally, GWT uses a slightly different base64 character set for serialized payloads. If you try to send standard YSO serial output encoded using standard base64 to a GWT RPC method, it will typically fail with an error like too few tokens in RPC request or java.io.eof exception. To build a valid payload, you will need to use the customized Bishop Fox version of YSO serial, which you can find at the URL shown below. You will also need to encode the output using the alternative base64 character set. Documentation for the customized YSO serial includes a Linux one-liner to generate the payload and also encode it correctly. For just about any case where I suspect a Java deserialization vulnerability, I recommend starting with YSO serial's URL DNS payload. That's because even though it doesn't execute arbitrary code, it will give you an indication of successful deserialization against any version of Java unless the target can't resolve public DNS names. It doesn't depend on the presence of any vulnerable third-party libraries, unlike the other payloads. So for this initial test, I'll copy a burp suite collaborator hostname, then use it to construct a payload generation command for the customized version of YSO serial. When using the dash dash gwit option, the next argument is the field name string that I mentioned earlier. It's not critical for it to be valid, but if you've happened to figure out the correct field name for the value that you're tampering with, GWT will get a little further in some of its post-deserialization logic before erroring out. 
Now that I have the payload, I'll send one of the vulnerable GWT RPC requests to Burp's repeater module, replace the existing Base64 data with the payload, and send it. As you can see, Collaborator received a DNS resolution request indicating that the payload was deserialized. If you get this far, you can tell the application owner that their app is definitely vulnerable to a deserialization attack. Meaningful exploitation of a deserialization vulnerability depends on finding a payload that will do something of value to an attacker, such as executing arbitrary code. Whether or not an application can be exploited in that way generally depends on the app having specific, vulnerable libraries loaded. The documentation for our customized version of YSO Serial includes a quick method for generating payloads based on all of the command execution gadget chains included with the tool, but even if none of the standard payloads are successful, it doesn't mean the application is safe. An attacker with knowledge of a gadget chain that hasn't been publicly disclosed, or waits until a new one is disclosed, can potentially still compromise the application. I'll run the payload generation command now, and try each of the results in repeater. Of course, in a real test, I'd script this step using something like curl. As you can see, each of these commands tries to cause a web request to my collaborator server with a URI based on the payload name to make it easier to sort out which ones were successful. Scrolling through the collaborator log, I can see that for this example application, two payloads successfully executed OS commands, Jython2 and Jython3. I could pick either of these and replace the curl command with one that would download and execute a sliver C2 implant, and then continue exploiting the server from there. If you've already found and exploited a vulnerable GWT RPC method using the steps above, you can probably call it a day. But if you didn't find any candidate methods or want to perform a more thorough check, you can use an alternative approach, which is based on looking for GWT RPC serialization policy files that contain the decorator at client fields. This is a good way to find even obscure uses of the vulnerable mechanism, but it can be harder to exploit a given instance of the issue because crafting a GWT RPC request by hand is not at all straightforward. As I mentioned earlier, it's also a much more involved process. If you'd like to learn more about that second approach, please take a look at my blog post on the Bishop Fox website. As I mentioned, there's a second, more thorough technique for assessing whether an application is vulnerable or not. If you have access to the code that's actually deployed on the web application server, not just the source code, you can grep through those files for the string at client fields. If you're performing a zero knowledge test, the process is a little too lengthy for this presentation, but you can refer to my blog post on bishopfox.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about GWT and Java deserialization, check out our blog posts on bishopfox.com. We'd love to know what you think about this technical training session. Let us know in the chat. Join me in the Hackers Lounge on the Bishop Fox Discord server if you want to talk more in depth. Hope to see you there.